Before I begin, I want to say three things very clearly. I believe that many people currently labelled as having profound intellectual disabilities have intellectual capacity. And I believe we should have high expectations for all people. And people with profound intellectual disabilities exist and their lives are valid and valuable. Nothing I'm about to say is a denial of any of those things, but if you view it as kind of black and white, then they can be taken as such. My objection is to alls and everyones, these proclamations that all people can or everyone will. When the expectations, the high expectations for everyone are for the same thing, or when everyone is expected to achieve a certain skill, I don't think what we have is aspirational, I think it's prejudice. This is more about, you know, the greys. There is a narrative about currently that denies the existence of people with profound intellectual disabilities and it frames their apparent existence as a failure of those around them to support them, people not having high expectations, not having access to the right tech. And there's a second part to that narrative that claims that it does no harm. Like, we might as well try and teach everybody to do whatever it is, because then we definitely won't miss anybody who could have done it. And as for the ones that could never have done it, like, there's no problem, nothing, nothing ventured, nothing gained type of thing. <laughs> Recently, you've been witnessing me pushing myself to the limits of my intellectual ability. And that was my choice. And it's been a tough ride and I'm clever enough to do it. But I've got far cleverer friends who have chosen not to do this. And probably because they are cleverer, they think I'm an idiot for attempting it. And But just because I push myself to my intellectual ability doesn't mean that they should. It doesn't mean that everyone should. It doesn't mean that everybody should be encouraged to do it. It was my choice. I've grown up around people experiencing disability all of my life. So I wonder if approaching this from a different perspective, like picking on some of their stories, maybe it won't sound as silly. Yeah. There are people who can walk example and people who cannot walk and who will never be able to walk and then there's like everyone in between walking is useful <laughs> people like walking you could say walking is good therefore everyone should learn to walk you know I know some amazing little tots um, local to me that doctors wrote off but their parents had high expectations they sought out the support, they got the equipment, they spent all the time, all the money, they got the experts and the children learned to walk and they love walking. Yeah, Instagram is full of memes like this. They celebrate the achievements because walking is good. But there are other stories. So I often remember Alison Lapper, the artist who was born with no arms and shortened legs. She speaks very passionately about how when she was a child she was expected to wear these big bulky prosthetics and to learn to walk because walking is good you know and it was hours of her time it was painful it was torturous you know if this is not a perfect example but these examples are all pointing at what I'm talking about I had a friend at university who had a degenerative condition and shortly after we finished university, she began re using a wheelchair and they were so clear in their posts on social media at the time how stupid they'd been in not using a wheelchair sooner. She tried to keep up with the walking people because walking is good, walking is best, not being able to walk is worst. There's a hierarchy here, there's a prejudice here. And she said actually using the chair, she's much more able you know, the chair isn't creating disability, it's creating ability. Maybe it's not walking that's good, maybe it's mobility that's good. People with profound intellectual disabilities exist and they will never be able to do certain things. Things that require abstract thought like recognising symbols, letters, counting, that sort of thing. 
And that's not automatically bad, just in the way that not being able to walk isn't automatically bad. They don't automatically need rescuing from that, just in the way that somebody who isn't able to walk doesn't have to be able to walk. What they need is the, the, the mobility. And when it comes to intellectual disability, what they need is the understanding. That's their equivalent of a wheelchair. And that understanding doesn't come about by denying their existence. There are people with profound intellectual disabilities who, if they were made to practice certain intellectual skills for hours and hours, over years and years, with all the right expertise and tech and everything like that, could manage to do a little bit of, inter of intellectualising the thinking. Alison managed to walk on her prosthetics, but it cost her a lot of pain. And the idea that pushing people relentlessly, without question, to always assume that intellectually more is better. It doesn't risk physical pain, but you risk mental pain. You risk mental harm. We're not doing it to be mean. We're doing it because we believe that walking is good and therefore not walking is bad and will save you from the not walking. We think that thinking is good and therefore not being able to think is bad and it must be solved. This is such a socially accepted prejudice. You know, it's what the numbers have been about. I've been counting how many times I could use it without it seeming out of place. It's really uncomfortable doing that. But we are allowed to think that being stupid is bad, i.e. not having intellectual capacity is bad. We use it as an insult. This is prejudice. And that having intellectual capacity is therefore good. I will doctor myself and be like, oh, look at me. Um, people with profound intellectual disabilities exist and their lives are valid and valuable. In the shades of grey, it should never be an all or everyone decision. They should be evaluated individually. I remember a friend of mine whose brother has an intellectual disability talking about how for his whole life he's been pushed to be more than he is, continually pushed for that next tiny increment in intellectual capacity. Imagine if someone was doing that to you, you know, Think, and they're doing it because thinking is good and not being able to think is bad. And she said, I just wish sometimes he was allowed to just be himself and enjoy the capacities that he has. That's, that's what my friends who didn't study PhDs have done. In the end, what it boils down to is choice and fun. It should be the person's choice and the doing of it should be fun. It's like, I have enjoyed doing the PhD. It might not have seemed like it, but I have enjoyed it. If you're sat in a classroom and you don't know whether the students that you're sat with have the capacity to learn to count, to learn phonics, whatever it is, but you're obliged legally to spend an hour a day every day for, for, for the next eternity doing those things, then make damn sure they're fun. <laughs> fun that could be enjoyed by someone who does not have intellectual capacity. My work at the Sensory Projects, a lot of what I'm looking at, especially with the Sensory Stories Project, is would this serve somebody who has intellectual capacity and would this serve somebody who does not have intellectual capacity? Because I'm aware that there's people who are working in spaces where you don't know and you've definitely got both groups there. <laughs> as a little PS, I was just about to switch it off, but as a little PS, I've been told that I shouldn't talk about these people because in that tweeter's opinion, they're such a tiny minority that the belief in their existence holds back the larger majority of intellectually capable people who are not recognised as such because, as anyone who uses a wheelchair will tell you, many people automatically assume that if you have a physical, physical disability... Oh, also, anybody who has a speech impairment um, can back this up tenfold. Um, if, if you're disabled in some way, then you must also be intellectually disabled. But the truth is we don't know. And because we don't know, we should proceed with uncertainty, not certainty. Not these big, bold declarations of everybody must or all people can. And meet each person as an individual, get to know them, what they enjoy, don't enjoy, suss out 
in which direction their being flows, you know. I speak about it because I think that they are the most vulnerable demographic and there's grim research stats to back that up and they're the least able to advocate for themselves and therefore the most at risk of not even being considered. <laughs> oh, and to do, um, to do a final, final PS, the least able to advocate thing is not the whole story. If we find ways to experience meaning together, to work with, then their voices can be heard in new ways. And you can see my PhD work for that stuff. But yeah, people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities exist and their lives are valid and valuable.